about Y Combinator's data. But before I do that, I wanted to just ask a few questions to get a sense of like who's in the audience. So can I get a quick show of hands? Um, how many people here are running their own startup? Quite a lot of you, that's awesome. How many people here are working for someone else's startup where that startup is not called Mixed Panel? <laughs> okay. And um, how many of you have applied or think you might apply to Y Combinator? Quite a few of you. Okay, sweet. So, um, we've never given this talk before. The genesis of the talk is I was talking to Marshall from Mixpanel, and he said, what can you guys talk about involving your data? And so I said, well, I don't know. Um, but I went spelunking through Y Combinator's data, and I came back with some things that I think are pretty interesting. And it, it worked pretty well, I think, because YC is a pretty unique set of data. Um, we funded like a really large number of companies now, and we do it in an unusually regular process where we have exactly two applications every year. The application questions basically haven't changed in 11 years. The applications are structured, so there's a lot of interesting stuff that we can get from it. Um, so YC has funded over a thousand companies, including Mixpanel. Woo! Woo! Um, also, some other ones you probably heard of: Airbnb, Dropbox, Stripe, Zenefits, Reddit. Um, we, we do this by reading lots of applications. We actually get 10,000 applications every year. I personally read two to 3,000 of them every year, which is kind of grueling. Um, but, but also really interesting because you get to see all these awesome ideas that people are having. Um, and so the first thing that I did is I went through these applications and I built something that's a little bit like the Google Zeitgeist. Do you guys know the Google Zeitgeist? It's this thing they do every year where they like mine the search queries for the trends. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I did something like this, and I call it like the Y Combinator idea zeitgeist. It's like a zeitgeist of what kinds of startups people wanted to start in different years. Um, and the first set of trends come from the, the first question in the application, which is just, what is your company going to make? So if you look at the words in this question, you can get a lot of interesting insights. So one, one really dramatic trend is in the last two years, basically everybody woke up and decided that the thing that the world really needed was an app for Slack. Um, so um, the, uh, the majority of these are like chatbots and other apps for the, for the, for the Slack app store. Um, and that is something that people see as a really big opportunity. We, we funded a few of these, so I think, I think there is something there. Um, the, the other big mega trend in the last few years is artificial intelligence. Just this incredible surge of interest in artificial intelligence, and in particular in deep learning, we get AI for everything these days. Uh, some of the trends sort of come and go. So there was a, there was a backtrack in 2014 where I swear that every second application I read was Bitcoin something. Um, and that fortunately has sort of debated. But interestingly, blockchain, which is the, the underlying technology behind Bitcoin, is still uh, seeing a lot of interest. Uh, also, uh, back in 2012, there was a batch where it felt like everybody was starting GitHub for X, GitHub for data, GitHub for science, GitHub for sheet music, GitHub for poetry, GitHub, and just like everything. Um, now that's not, not as, as big anymore. Uh, virtual reality is still really hot, which is awesome. Uh, we're, we're big believers in VR. We hope more people will start VR companies. Another interesting th trend is actually the, the business model. So back in 2008, around the time that I went through my Combinator, uh, like the most common business model was people were like, well, I'm just going to get a lot of users, and then I'm going to put ads on my product. Um, and that is sort of trending down. And what's trending up is SaaS, which is basically short for people will give me money. Woo! <laughs> so I think that's probably a positive trend. We have a we have another question on the on the YC app that just says like who who are your competitors? And so if we look at the answers here, we can see who people think are like scary competitors over time. Okay, so we've got four on this chart. So the first one is Twitter, that's the green one. So you can see that like back in 2010, there was just like a bajillion things for Twitter. Like, analytics for Twitter, ads for Twitter, clients for Twitter, just like everything for Twitter. Um, and now that there aren't as many of those things, and Twitter hasn't really launched many new products, 
they're, they're not really seen as a competitor outside of their core business. Um, one, one thing that I think is really impressive actually is the Google line, which is the red line. You can see that that's like constant all the way from 2008 to 2016. Like Google keeps launching so many new things that they stay very relevant as a competitor to, to, to lots of different products. Um, and, and the last thing that I think is pretty interesting is that orange line, which is Microsoft down there recoloring the x-axis. <laughs> <laughs> So e even though Microsoft is still like a really profitable business, it's just clearly not really seen as relevant to the kinds of things that people are making today. Um, this will give us an opportunity to gloat about some of the, the giants of past years. I don't know if you guys even remember MySpace, but back in 2008, they were really scary. <laughs> Okay, so when, when people apply to Y Combinator, you, you select a category for, for your company. And there's a couple of interesting things here. So this looks at the acceptance rate by category of company. So if you look at the left, that's biotech. Basically, a lot of the biotech companies that applied got in. Whereas in the right, that's like community, which is like, I don't know, like a social network for dog lovers. Um, <laughs> You can see like we, we, we accept like a much smaller percentage of, of those companies. And and you you know, I, I, I thought a lot about sort of the, the underlying reason for this trend. And you might think that it's because we have this like huge bias where we just like really love biotech companies, but I, I actually don't think that's the case. I think it's that um, YC kind of has a bias for big ambitious ideas and a lot of the entertainment and community ideas are just sort of not really big ambitious ideas. Um, but what's interesting is that if you look at the number at the number of applications we get, it's like inverse to the acceptance percentage. <laughs> so like we don't take a lot of community apps, but like for every one company that's like trying to cure cancer, we get like 17 to-do list apps and social networks for X and Y. Okay, so um, last section is I wanted to look at the founders who who's actually applying to my combinator. Um, so first off, female founders. So we, um, this is 21% of companies have a female founder and it's 17, 7% all, all female teams. We're, we're actually pretty proud of these numbers. They're still a long way away from what they could be, but they're well above industry norms. And Y Combinator has really taken uh, outspoken role doing a lot of outreach and events around encouraging more female founders to start companies. So I'm optimistic these numbers will continue to, to trend up. Um, in terms of age, it's actually a lot older than people think it is. The, the, the average founder at YC is 30 years old. Um, there's this expectation, I think, that like startup founders need to be like Mark Zuckerberg. I think maybe because the press disproportionately like to write about young founders. It's also like really varied. So 15% of the founders of Y Combinator can't legally drink. This, this causes some issues with Y Combinator events. We haven't been raided by the police just yet. Um, and 18% and of them are, are, are over 40, so there really isn't like a too old to start a startup. And in terms of number of founders, like we've always recommended like two to three is kind of the optimal number, and then like one to four is acceptable. We had a company apply the last batch with 13 founders. I don't recommend that. <laughs> Um, and an interesting trend is that the, the number of single founder applications is declining. Not like a lot, but like enough, you can see it. I, I think this is probably an industry-wide trend and probably a good one. And the, the last stat I have for you is about repeat applications. Um, basically, a lot of companies that are accepted to Y Combinator are accepted on like the <coughs> second, third, fourth, fifth application. In fact, of just of the companies that we accepted in the last batch, 40% of them had applied before and been rejected and they were being accepted on like their second application and 9% were accepted on like their fourth or higher application. We just led in the company on their seventh application to Y Combinator. So when, when people don't get into Y Combinator, they, they often ask us what they should do and our advice in general is like, keep working on your startup and apply again. Um, and so that's all the stats that I have for you guys. I think Marshall wanted to come up here and ask me some questions. We collected a bunch of questions over the internet. So I think we were gonna start with those and then take some from the crowd. Is that the plan? Was that's that totally the plan. Yeah, you wanna grab a seat? Cool. You can like relax yeah. for a minute. <laughs> Maybe a big round of applause for our for chair. Yeah. 
So uh, uh, everyone who I think uh, signed up uh, for this event, uh, as well as many folks who uh, came to us through uh, Post on Hacker News, um, had the opportunity to pose questions. And so we had gathered uh, a number of them that we thought were uh, particularly poignant, and, uh, and so we're going to sort of go through them here today. Um, don't worry, don't have your feelings hurt. If I don't answer your question, um, you can probably uh, ask it here um, when we open it up to the, to the floor. So the first question we have here is, how important is a founder's background or uh, pedigree for acceptance in, into Y Combinator? So there's an interesting story behind this question. So when, when my combinator got started, it was founded by a guy called Paul Graham, who's a computer scientist. And Paul, Paul Graham's original thesis was that the best startup founders would be like really, really smart people. And so we funded like a lot of like PhDs in computer science and other people who like look very smart on paper. And um, a couple years later, he realized that like that thesis was wrong and that actually the number one criteria of success in a startup founder is determination. And so we stopped founding, we, 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 we like reduced our bias towards uh, PhD. You guys remember? Um, to, towards uh, PhDs in computer science and began funding people who were like high school dropouts and people from like all kinds of backgrounds who just like really, really wanted to start a company. And I think that's been like a really positive trend. Sorry. Yeah. That uh, uh, that seems to be, uh, I guess, like kind of counterintuitive. But the idea uh, that like maybe the most important thing is to be like a cockroach is, um, I guess, important. Um, <laughs> that uh, you just don't want to die, um, which uh, seems great. So ambition and uh, sort of determination, and then apparently uh, being uh, persistent, sound like like three really great features of of, of founder. Um, so, what guidance or criteria, not about the, the people, but about sort of the, the company, um, would you provide to people uh, when they're sort of trying to achieve this product market fit? So, how to achieve product market fit? So, um, the most important thing to do when you're trying to achieve product market fit is to find, is to design your product so that some people love it a lot. There's like a natural tension because often, and sometimes analytics can lead you astray here, where you just build a product that like a lot of people like a little or just have kind of a really casual relationship with. And that can be successful, but like strongly correlated with success is products that like a small number of people really love and really engage with. All the, all the best Y Combinator companies started that way, including Mixpanel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, uh, this is maybe a little bit of a digression. So um, this is something that uh, you and I had chatted about a bit uh, on the phone where a lot of people try to use metrics that like seem like things that would be good, like the number of people who use it every day, say is a very poor proxy for whether there are some people who really love it, right? Like your, your six month retention is say like a good measure of whether someone yeah. really loves your app, like how many people used it yesterday, like maybe isn't so good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, cool. So um, what YC companies have most effectively used data early on uh, to make important business decisions this is a natural segue from the last question. Um, so there's a great story about how Airbnb used data early on. I know Airbnb gave a talk recently. I think they talked about like all the fancy stuff that they're doing with data now, but like that came like much, much later. Like in the early days, Airbnb just maniacally tracked one metric, the number of room nights booked. That simple but what they did was they like made that metric like the center of their lives and they and they did it actually in like a really old-fashioned way where they'd actually like like take the graph of the number of room of room nights booked and they print it out and they put it everywhere like like over the toilet and like all over their apartment was this graph of the number of room nights booked so they couldn't get away from it and they would just like spend like every conversation went back to like, what can we do today that will most increase the number of room nights booked? That's uh, that's this sort of focus on like this like one key metric and making it be a good metric and then just I, it, putting the the, the, the graph in the bathroom is perhaps like a really good one. So you're just haunted by it constantly. Um, that's, uh, that's good. Um, so. Considering um, there's been, uh, I guess, uh, maybe for folks who have been paying attention in uh, private markets for uh, uh, software, that there's been uh, sort of a, uh, some people call it a softening or uh, an increased focus on uh, profitability over growth. Um, so the, this question pertains to whether um, Y Combinator is sort of internalizing that uh, sort of movement from late stage uh, private markets um, to really shift the focus that, uh, that it, for the advice that you provide uh, to very early on companies. Is that something that's been going on or do, do late stage markets not matter at all for what you're doing? 
Yeah, so I'm sure you guys read a lot in the press about how like the world is ending and investors aren't funding companies anymore and all these unicorns are gonna lose their horns or whatever. Um, and I, I, think, I think these trends are real to a certain extent and I do think that they, they matter for later stage companies that have to plan financing strategies. But I think that at the stage that Y Combinator funds companies like pre-series A, like it actually, our advice like literally never changes. So um, Y Combinator has been doing this for 11 years now and when we started, basically no investors were funding startups because startup was like a dirty word and then like it got really good and then like the financial meltdown happened and like nobody was funding startups and then like seed rounds took off again and everybody was funding startups and now people say that the world is ending and like the fact <laughs> is that like neither us nor you nor anyone can predict what's gonna happen. And so as an early stage startup, like your best bet is to just be extremely conservative because you never know. And so our advice has always been treat every investment round as if it's gonna be the last money that you ever see and figure out how you're gonna get to break even on that amount of money. Be really frugal with your expenses and get ramen profitable as quickly as possible. <laughs> Do you guys know the phrase ramen profitable? Like it 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 comes from like like you're making enough money that like everyone in your company can live as long as they like live so cheaply that they're just eating ramen. <laughs> That's great. So this idea of, of being conservative through focusing on unit economics like very, very early is, uh, is really what you think uh, is good advice. And that's always sort of been good advice. Um, cool. So what uh, are the best characteristics of a technical co-founder besides being technical? So I think that if you're, if you're bringing on like a, a true, a, a technical co-founder, like the first thing to, to, to do is to make sure that they are actually a co-founder. Sometimes we find like teams where the technical co-founder is really like an employee and that's, that's not a good balance. I don't think that's healthy for any company that is like doing something that's technically challenging. You, you, you really want to bring on a technical co-founder who is like your equal and that means somebody who not just writes code, but like really understands the business because the, 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 the power of a technical co-founder is that you have someone in your company who truly understands everything, like the entire stack, everything from like the lowest levels of the code, how everything works down here, to like the business and like what the customers want and what the regulations are and who the competitors are and can, and can understand the whole thing and internalize it all, which enables them to make really good decisions because a lot of the most important decisions in software companies require somebody who is that like holistic view. And so you wanna look for somebody who is smart enough and a deep enough thinker and is interested in the business problems as well as the technical problems who can do all of those things. So I guess so this is um, uh, a little bit of a, a segue, but so I mean, so you meet someone, right? And, and they're like, a, seem like a really, you know, interesting person, but like you're not sort of like sure whether they like meet that bar, right? And so then you're, you're sort of stuck wondering to know whether they should be the first employee or your co-founder. Um, how do you like resolve that? Like do you, like what do you do, do you think? Yeah. So co-founder relationships are like marriages, like really, they're like marriages. And like sometimes we see people who do like the startup equivalent of like meeting a girl in the bar and like driving to Vegas and get, getting married the next day. And you're just like, like would you do that in real life? Like what, what kind of judgment is that? Like, like actually if your startup is successful, you will be together with your co-founder for like 10 years, which I think is longer than the average US marriage. So, um, so like don't, don't jump into this overnight. Um, we see that like most co-founder relationships, the vast majority of successful co-founder relationships don't actually start with the startup. They start with like, some shared experience that you had with this person and someone that you've known for a long time before you started to start a startup. So like definitely optimize for that rather than somebody who you met at like a uh, founders meetup. Um, if, you, if, you, if you don't know any, if you don't know the right people and you do need somebody, like don't just like decide to start a company with them, take it slowly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, and it seems like it's still healthy for, I guess maybe the number was, you know, 30 or 40% of, of, of Y Combinator uh, uh, companies are still single founder. I think that's what the number was. So you're not totally in the weeds if you can't find your, your lifelong partner. Um, so that's, that's reassuring. Um, so now let's kind of shift, uh, shift gears and talk about uh, uh, some specific advice uh, for uh, YC applications. Um, so first, maybe could you sort of generally describe in a minute or two what uh, the application consists of? Yeah, sure. So it's a little bit like applying to college. Um, it's just a bunch of questions and you fill them out and you apply. Um, 
we're, we're one of, um, when, when Y Combinator created an application for funding, it was like a radical idea because back in 2005, the only way to get funding was to like know investors. You had to like be networked to know the right people and then like they introduce you to investors and like you got the right introduction, they take your, your, your app, they, they'd like uh, take you really seriously, otherwise they'd completely ignore you. And um, we, we said like, why does it matter who you know Anyone should be able to, to 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 get funding if they have a good company, and so we'll just like post an application, and people will apply. And so we we tried this, and it turned out that there were like a lot of really good founders in the world who didn't like know the right people in Silicon Valley to to get funding, and but they just applied to Y Combinator. And so um, the application has been like a really core part of YC from the beginning. So that's cool. the background. That's that's great. That's great. So. Um, what uh, are some of the biggest mistakes that people make on their YC application? So the number one biggest mistake is I read the application and I have no freaking idea what you were doing. <laughs> I can't tell you how many applications that I've like read them three times and I'm like, I have no idea what this company does. So um, like the number one piece of advice is like, make sure that at the end of reading the application, people actually understand what the company does in a very concrete way. And I will give you an example to illustrate this. So imagine your name is Larry Page and the year is 1999 and you are applying with your new idea for a startup. Here is the wrong way to describe it. My company is going to organize the world's information and make it universally useful and accessible. I have no idea what that freaking means. Okay, here's the right way to describe it. We are building a search engine. It is better than current search engines because it uses the relevance information contained in the link graph of the web to deliver higher quality results. Now, now I understand what the idea is. Like, <laughs> and there's, and, and there's, I think, some real truth to this, which is like, even though Google today is the second idea, like that wasn't the original idea for Google. And so I think sometimes people, I think sometimes people may sort of mislearn lessons by looking at big and successful companies at like what they are now versus what they. Yeah, and, and in some way, I mean, that's it's it's highly correlated with being ambitious, right? That like you want someone who's ambitious, and so then they like write on their application that they want to take over the world and organize all the data. But you're like, no, no, no but I need to know. I need to know step one, uh, maybe step two, uh, but not step fifteen. Uh, that's that's great. Um, which uh, uh, are there parts of the application that founders often sort of think are are negative, but really then when you are reading through thousands of them, you're like, oh, this is great. This is like a super big positive. Yeah. Um, so. One thing that we really love is when founders point out weaknesses in their business. Um, every startup has like tons of weaknesses, um, and that's okay. Um, it shows us that you're insightful and like really understand what's happening. And if there's like a really gaping weakness in your business and you don't point it out, we're kind of like left wondering like, well, do they know that Google just launched this thing? So, um, so like. For sure, like actually point out all the things that are wrong, and you know some way that you might be able to solve it, but don't don't be shy about that. And and this is true not just for YC but for other investors as well. Uh, absolutely, that uh, uh, that sounds great. So now comes the time where we're going to uh, open it up to uh, to all of you out there uh, on the live stream uh, out here in the audience. Uh, I do want to give a couple of caveats. This is not the time to ask whether Jared thinks that your startup is a good idea, um, or to ask him why uh, you didn't get into Y Combinator last year, because apparently the advice is apply again. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, show of hands, um, uh, who has a question out there? I just wanted to ask you about the um, uh, about your um, your view of the the overall risk profile of the choices that Y Combinator makes. Paul Graham wrote, wrote a fantastic article about um, you know every, all of the all of the companies now that go through Y Combinator now get funded, but partly because you know an investor group said we will fund everyone that Y Combinator picks. But he said that actually we're not picking crazy enough ideas if we're actually adhering to our overall investment thesis, which is that all of our returns come from you know, whatever it is, four or five percent of the companies, the Airbnbs, the Dropboxes. So having joined the team recently, how do you feel now that you have the responsibility for, uh, you know, making those uh, kind of um, decisions alongside Sam and the rest of the team? Yeah, so, 
kind of the premise of the question, which is really true. And this is true for YC, and it's true for every other investor, which is that um, in, investing is like a hit-driven business. And it, it's it's so much so that it's like a little hard for like human brains to comprehend because like exponential math is really crazy. Um, but like uh, essentially, even though we've invested in like over a thousand companies, really there's only like a handful that matter in terms of like uh, how successful Y Combinator will will actually be as a company. Um, and as and as a result of that, we look for companies which are which have the potential to be like really huge companies. But the thing is, so here's here's the thing not to take away from this. Like that is like a mathematical truth. But I think people sometimes misinterpret it because they're building some app that I don't know, it's like a chat like a chatbot for Slack and they're like I have no idea how my like chatbot for Slack could become like the next Google. So like clearly I must not be appropriate for Y Combinator, so I'm not going to apply. But like the fact is that most most of the companies that like get over a billion dollars, like it's not super obvious from the beginning that they're gonna be that way. Like when Airbnb applied to Y Combinator, it was just um, it was just like a service for people to rent air mattresses in like crappy apartments, which is definitely not a billion dollar idea, but then it grew. Um, and so... Well, I was going to say, but, but how, do you, how do you think about now your own job in the context of that? I mean, are you returns driven or are you looking for like Peter Thiel's overlap of like, is a good idea and sounds well, like a bad, bad idea? idea. Yeah, so there's this kind of famous chart that like the best startup ideas are the ones that actually sound kind of like bad ideas because the ideas that are like obviously good ideas, like everyone's doing, the, the, uh, everyone is doing those ideas. Like by the time it's obvious that an idea is good, it's kind of like too late to start it, which I think is usually but not always true. Um, and so, yeah, so when, when, when we look at Y Combinator applications, we're looking for outliers. We're, we're looking for companies that are doing things that are really unique and different and might very well be worth zero. And it's totally okay if like most of the companies that we fund end up being worth zero, as long as some people are trying some crazy experiments that might pay off. Um, so my question is a little bit fintech specific, and it's regarding how many applications you're seeing of companies that are coming into Y Combinator who are trying to solve the B2B problem as opposed to the B2C problem. Um, we've seen a lot of fintech companies try to tackle the consumer space. I'm wondering how many of them are trying to now tackle the enterprise space, and if that's something. Okay, so within fintech, the breakdown of B2B fintech versus the breakdown of B2C fintech. Okay. Um, so I do know offhand the breakdown of B2B versus B2C companies. And I can tell you that in the early days of Y Combinator, it was like overwhelmingly B2C companies, and that has now shifted, and it's the majority of the Y Combinator companies are doing something B2B, broadly speaking. Um, within FinTech, I think that there's sort of a trend where every time there's a new idea, like often the B2C ideas are the ones that got done first, and then the B2B versions like come later. And so I think there's a lot of ideas out there where like the B2C version has been done and is well established, but there's a lot of opportunities to apply the same thing to businesses. Thank you. Right next door. Yeah, so in the presentation you touched a lot about like the data that uh, my commenters have been collecting. And as time passes, you, you come to have more and more alone. So I just want to have like a, a bit of an intake on how are you using your Y Combinator alum base to, at a data-driven um, level to influence your incoming class? You know, how, how are you taking your, the input that your alums give with a grain of salt, or how are you using that data as a whole? So Y Combinator now has over 2,500 alumni, um, and it's a pretty talented, impressive group of people. Um, and one, one thing that we're, we're doing now to a certain extent and want to do a lot more of in the future is really tracking the companies after they leave Y Combinator. Because if you think about it, if all these companies and the data that they generate shouldn't just stop like when they apply to Y Combinator, it goes throughout the whole life of their company. So we have a system now where 
companies essentially self-report data back to us, all kinds of things, revenue, team size, bank account, how much they raised, who, who it's from, internal metrics, all, 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 all kinds of things. And we collect that data and hopefully in the future we're gonna be able to get some, some really good insights from that and be able to share it back with the new crop of companies. Today, social is not maybe the sexiest uh, market, uh, at least for all the apps, uh, all the applications you receive. And what's the deal with the uh, the companies in the, in the uh, entertainment market? Like, what's not sexy about entertainment? So Y Combinator actually doesn't invest in sexy ideas per se. So like, um, I showed you guys the, the graph with like the bajillion Bitcoin companies. Like out of all those Bitcoin companies, we only invest in I think two Bitcoin companies. So we, we're not like really trend based the way some investors are. We're not looking for sexy ideas. What I think is going on there is that um, there are a lot of founders that gravitate towards ideas that seem not intimidating. Like starting a startup sounds like incredibly intimidating. Like, how do you start the next Google? Like, that's scary. And so they say, well, but like, I could build an app that's like a to do list manager. Because, like, to do list manager, like, that doesn't sound so scary. Like, I could do that. Um, and so I think there's, there's sort of this inherent bias towards, like, not very, um, um, uh, intimidating ideas, and I, I think that's what's coming through in those entertainment apps. I've read a lot of those entertainment apps, and a lot of it are things that, where I read it, and I'm, and I'm just like, is this really the most important problem that you guys could have picked to work on right now? <clears throat> well, last uh, question for you. Um, would you rather have a long and detailed application explaining exactly how everything works, or a short one that keeps everything high level? Something in the middle. Hey guys, we have this great question from Jackie in our community, and you can also ask questions in the next time in the future lined up at community.mixnow.com. So Jackie has this question for Jared. When it comes to a company culture, not the vibes, but the actual makeup of what fellow employees can expect from one another, how do you look to help encourage teams to cultivate healthy, inclusive, and safe ones? Is it something that you get forth that into, or do you hand off and leave that to the team? So I think it's, it's a great question. Um, one, one thing that we've seen is like, the number one most important thing for companies to get right in the early stages is making something that people want. Um, like if you don't get that, then basically your company won't go anywhere. But then the, the most important thing to figure out once you make something people want is building the company culture. Like that's what, determines like the trajectory of companies after they leave Y Combinator. We hope that everybody leaves Y Combinator having made something that people want, but it's normally afterwards that they like need to create a company culture. And so um, the founders that do that well have a huge advantage. And so to answer that question specifically, I think that company cultures really do come from the founders. Um, it's kind of amazing when you like walk into different company cultures knowing the founders. You, it's almost like the company culture is like an extension of the founders' personalities. And it's, kind of cool how it works that way. And so I think company culture is something that you work out with a lot of participation from the team and they're like really involved. But I think that's one of the few things that like founders really can't handle. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was that was one thing that uh, uh, I guess a slightly less shameless plug for Mixpanel that um, I was very impressed that uh, uh, the founders of Mixpanel interviewed the first 100 people who were hired not the first hundred interviews. Like every one of the first hundred people here was an hour long interview with one of the founders. And I, like, I think that's a sort of an extension, uh, one of these ways to sort of maintain culture uh, over a great long period of time. hundred people's a lot of, a lot of time. Great example. Yeah, cool, wonderful. Well, um, there's still uh, plenty of time to uh, chat with folks uh, in, the, in the demo zone, uh, uh, to chat among yourselves and to, uh, you know, have some, uh, some snacks and some beverages. So, Peter, please give a round of applause for, for Jared. Thanks so much. Thank you.